Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, bookshops, Japanese warriors and theatre in Istanbul. To survive the pandemic, American and British indie bookshops come together on the one website. Paris's Shakespeare and Company plans to build an online network of supporters. And curtains open for this year's Istanbul Theatre Festival. COVID-19 restrictions are financially hurting independent booksellers, which were in a bind thanks to the likes of Amazon. But now these mom-and-pop establishments have bookshop.org. Sellers that don't have an online store can join the website and they, along with the authors, get more than 75% of the profits. Bookshop.org currently operates in the United States and the UK, but the hope is to expand around the world. Let's talk to the founder and CEO of Bookshop.org, Andy Hunter. Hi, Andy. Lovely to have you on Showcase. Thanks a lot for joining us. So let's put this whole thing into context first. You thought that something was wrong in the system. That's why you came up with this project. So tell me what kind of a situation were independent bookshops in when you launched Bookshop.org? Yeah, well, for the past um, 10 or 15 years, Amazon has been growing at a, at a rapid pace and has taken control over 50% of the market uh, for book sales. And independent bookstores are essential for a uh, culture around books. You know, they're really wonderful places where children's schools, book groups, book clubs, authors, everybody and readers connect to each other. And they're really essential for having a healthy culture around books. So um, I wanted to make sure that they were going to be sustainable in the future. And that meant they need to be able to sell books online and their loyal customers who love them need to be able to support them when they buy books online and not just shop uh, um, on other online retailers. So we wanted to create a simple platform where it was really easy without any financial commitment, without any money or um, technical knowledge, a bookstore could set up a page online and start selling books to their customers. Um, and yeah, that's why we launched it. And so far, it's been really great. We have 900 stores in the US that are on the platform and over 250 stores in the UK. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have two questions about what you've just said. D does this mean that independent bookstores cannot survive without an online presence? Yes, I think, I think that's almost true now. It's certainly true right now because of the pandemic. A lot of stores are not able to open their doors right now. And a lot of customers aren't comfortable shopping in person. So for right now, you know, the pandemic has made it ex really essential, but in general, e-commerce, the number of people purchasing stuff online, that's increasing every year. So every local business needs to have an e-commerce strategy. Most local businesses have customers that, that want to support them. And if it's just as easy as shopping on, their shops as it is shopping on Amazon, then they have a good chance. But um, up until now, it's been difficult for stores to have to set up their own websites and mm -hmm. deal with it. So we just made it really easy to allow people to do that. Okay. Well, you sort of answered my second question, but would you call this a COVID-19 project? Is that uh, when and why you came up with it? No, we really came up with it just to ensure a healthy, sustainable future for bookstores. As more and more people shop online, we just want to make sure that bookstores have an e-commerce strategy that they can live with that's easy for them and that's easy for the customers. So bookshop.org was created to make it all simple, and it was really working. But when, um, when COVID-19 hit, it became essential like it might have been optional before for them to have an have a website it might have been a nice to have but when um bookshop launched and then COVID 19 hit six weeks later suddenly stores couldn't put their employees at health at risk by having them come into work sometimes there were shut down orders and the stores were not able to fulfill orders and so having an, a way to sell books online and deliver them directly to people's home became completely essential so while it, while it wasn't created to solve COVID 19 issues mm -hmm. it ended up a great solution for COVID-19. Okay, Andy, let's get realistic here. I am, I am an, I'm a reader. Uh, I read a lot of books. I buy a lot of books. Why should I use your website instead of, 
let's say Amazon, because obviously it's pretty much the same books, but then it is cheaper, for sure. Amazon is cheaper. So um, what value is there in using your website? Yeah, well, it's a socially conscious value, for sure. If all you care about is price, if that's all that matters to you, then you can continue to shop on Amazon. If you care about human beings and you care about your high street and your communities, um, then supporting local businesses is extremely important. Uh, you know, we connect with each other in common places, in places like bookstores, in downtowns or high streets. That's where communities gather and that's where like really great people work. And for readers, bookstores often were like gateways into a love of reading. When I was a kid and I would go into a bookstore, I would just sit in the aisles for hours and hours. They were my favorite places to go. And I dedicated my life to books after that. Bookstores work with schools, they work with libraries, they work with all kinds of institutions in their communities. And they're really, really important. And if you want to like shop on bookshop.org, what you're doing is you're saying, I care, I understand that where I spend my money matters. It makes a difference to my community and I don't mind paying an extra 50 cents or dollar in order to make sure that I'm supporting my values when I shop online mm -hmm. and that I sure that when the pandemic's over, I emerge into a world that I want to live in where there are still bookstores, where downtowns are not filled with shuttered, shuttered storefronts. You know, we want to have restaurants. We want to have live like bookstores, we want to have all kinds of local businesses still around after the pandemic, and they're yeah. all suffering right now. Amazon's not suffering. Amazon is up. You know, their sales are at a record high. <laughs> so they don't need your money right now, but small businesses do. All right. Let's flip the coin for a second, because it seems like a great project, and you're doing great in the US and now in the UK as well. Very quick success. But then, in marketplaces, we usually see independent stores in the long term being dependent on the seller. So yours is a marketplace as well. So what are you doing or are you doing anything to ensure that independent bookstores in the long term don't only rely on you or become dependent on you really? Yeah, well, we've done a number of things. First of all, we put in our articles of incorporation that we would never sell to Amazon or any other major retailer so that they can trust that we're not going to sell the company to somebody else who isn't going to protect their interests. Second, we are applying for B Corp's a certification, which will put us under independent oversight for, um, to make sure that we're an ethical company um, that is adhering to our mission. Third, we have a board of directors that is populated by booksellers. So we have a lot of independent local bookstore owners on our board of directors who vote about what we do to make sure that we're never going to do anything that's against their interests. So those are some of the protections that we've put into place, but we are very, very careful about that and very sincere about it because we want to be a long-term solution for the industry. And, and we understand that um, stores might be a little skeptical or wary of, of a changing environment where like we can put the squeeze on them, but you know, that's why we set up as a B corporation and put independent booksellers on our board because we're mission-based. We are mm -hmm. not, you know, we're, we're in it to save the bookstores. That's our cause. Okay, Andy. And um, how realistic do you think it is that we imagine independent bookstores can compete with Amazon? I think we're seeing it's very realistic. You know, there's, there's more value um, that bookstores can provide. They, they have human beings working there and human beings provide the best book recommendations and the best customer service and the best personality. And, you know, we're, what we're trying to do at bookshop.org is have some of that personality and personal curation and human feeling carry through on the web experience. And we're going to be adding more and more features to make that true. Um, but, you know, I never bought a book because a computer algorithm recommended it to me. I buy books <laughs> because people about people that I love or respect tell me that I should read a book and I think most people are like that they want to have a human connection even when they're shopping online and that's what bookstores and independent booksellers can provide that's lovely thank you Andy Hunter for joining us on showcase today and good luck with your project one iconic bookseller in Paris could probably benefit from an organization like bookshop.org Shakespeare and Company is battling financial woes stemming from Amazon and COVID-19 and the company is looking for a survival plan. 
The famous bookstore Shakespeare and Company is one of Paris's biggest tourist attractions. The likes of F. Scott Fitzgerald and James Joyce used to frequent this place. However, the century-old shop is in an economic crisis. Like many businesses, it's been badly impacted by the pandemic. Though they were not in a great place before either. Yellow vest protests and the nearby Notre Dame Cathedral fire have also impacted the bookshop's revenue. And now, a second lockdown. We've been um, minus 80% since the first confinement, so uh, since March. And so at this point we've used all our savings. We've, um, we have applied for and received quite a lot of support from the French government. Um, but we're just concerned about the future because uh, we feel that we're probably going to have a, another year of um, difficulty. The owner, Sylvia Whitman, says that difficulty also stems from the competition of online retailers. Buying books online has been a convenient way to shop during the pandemic, and it has put her business in a more dangerous spot. I understand why um, people would be using large online platforms more at the moment. It, they offer a good service, uh, a lot of us are stuck at home. Uh, I understand that, but it comes at a cost and I, I find it really tiring that it seems to be the bigger you are, uh, the more you can ignore laws, you can avoid taxes, you can um, uh, find loopholes, shall we say. Uh, and the smaller you are, the more expensive and the more, uh, the more complicated things are. Though to stay in business, she's been inspired by the company's history. During the Great Depression, the founder of the shop, Sylvia Beach, reached out to her friends to keep the Shakespeare and Company running. Today, the current owner, Whitman, is planning to create an online network called Friends of Shakespeare and Company, hoping it would be the solution to her problems. Remember when virtual art museums were the new thing? Well, it's quickly become old-fashioned after an artist put robots into play to keep people safe. Robots walking around, people locked to screens, rooms filled with lobster cartoons. Well, this isn't an episode of Black Mirror, but possibly the future. Hi, my name's Philip Colbert. This is my exhibition Lobsteropolis at Saatchi Gallery. It's the world's first show utilizing telepresent robots for a private view. It's a world first. That's great. Lobsteropolis can be visited in person or digitally from a computer or smartphone via remote-controlled robots on wheels with cameras and a tablet screen. The exhibition at London's Saatchi Gallery includes a variety of paintings and sculptures by pop artist Colbert centered on lobster cartoons. I wanted to stage my exhibition opening using these telepresent robots as almost like a sci-fi vision of a possible future where we do have a, a telepresent robot which goes out into the world for us so we stay protected at home and I felt that that was, not, was an interesting way of genuinely making the show more accessible but also creating a more um, fantastical vision of the future. Guests who booked robots for a tour can navigate them, zoom in and out on works in which the artist explores themes such as mass consumerism and contemporary digital culture. Auctioneer Simone de Puri joined this London event from his home in Monaco through a robot. This is something completely different because you can control yourself how you're moving through an exhibition. And it's really the closest thing that, you know, it places being in the exhibition space yourself, physically. Colbert thinks we're all likely to be dependent on robots in the coming years, so why not get used to being comfortable on our living room couches while taking in some art at the same time?
29 theater, dance and performance troops from around the globe have gathered in Istanbul, all to launch the city's top theater event. This year, stories focusing on women are at the forefront of Istanbul Theatre Festival. Traditional on-stage performances have their place on the programme as well. But due to the coronavirus pandemic, some shows featured in the 24th edition of the event will only be available online. We're now joined by Leman Yilmaz, the director of the Istanbul Theatre Festival. Hi, it's lovely to have you. Thanks a lot for joining us today on Showcase. So, let me start with this. What kind of an experience was it for you to organize a festival of this size during a pandemic of this size, really? Uh, it was very hard. And it's very hard because uh, everything is changing and we have many unknown situations. So, with my team, we decided uh, to organize a hybrid festival program and so we are very happy because it's very um, um, it's a very important uh, experience but it's a very important program also we organized an online program and also we are using the physical venues for the pro uh, for our festival program and but uh, the decision it was not so easy, um, and uh, but at least we had the time because when the pandemic was beginning uh, in March, so everything was cancelled or postponed, uh, and we said that uh, let's stay, uh, see what was going on in the world, also what are uh, what will be the decisions of the festivals and also institutions, the theaters, and we had the time to decide. Mm -hmm. But in November, at the same time, we know that the um, second wave and third wave uh, will come. And so, because of that, uh, we worked uh, on, di on different three scenarios. Okay, what scenarios uh -huh. were they? Uh, the first one, to keep the international program uh, in a hybrid uh, format. And second scenario is uh, we, uh, we organize some physical uh, performances coming from abroad also. And second scenario is uh, if the flights um, were closed or the, the the countries canceled the flights. So we said that we will do only with local uh, companies and uh, online program. And the third scenario was if everything was closed uh, during the festival. We will uh, organize only online program, and so uh, we worked on these the three scenarios. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I understand that you were convinced it would be okay holding an actual event, an actual play. But how dangerous is it right now? You think uh, when actually the second wave started to sweep across um, Turkey? Of course, we follow the news and everything. Also, the, the cases are rising, but uh, we had very important um, uh, report about the venues. So our human rights department and they, uh, with uh, their help, uh, uh, the, uh, the doctor of the of the foundation, but also the security for the security team, they all controlled all the venues. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, about the safety and healthy of the venues. So we checked the uh, uh, distance between the stage and the audience, and the audience and audience, and also the climate, uh, the fresh air is coming or not in the venues. So everything has changed, and now uh, it's very safe to to come and to see a performance in the closed venues. Okay, so uh, one thing is interesting for me, Lemon, is that um, you have COVID-19 specific content uh, and which is really inevitable because a lot of uh, theatre uh, professionals, you know, came up with uh, brand new uh, productions over the COVID-19 process. Why don't you tell us about your stories that tell uh, this process, a case per day, for example?
we are in general using the different titles. Yeah, uh, we had uh, this performance because they they did also during the Corona days uh, on their YouTube channel, and so we liked very much. And I I know the company, and uh, it was very interesting content. So. Uh, we talked and uh, we said that we we can do and by the you know, up, uh, updating the text uh, for for those days, the performance uh, online, and we have also, also other online performances. For example, we have a, um, a another performance. So you you can visit your home as a gallery. So by your mobiles or by your uh, computer so you, you use uh, your home because we we lived in our home during all those uh, uh, all those days and uh, we closed in our home and this play for example this performance is talking about uh, about your home you will discover your uh, your home like uh, you discovered an ex exhibition in a gallery mm -hmm. Yeah, because obviously we spend more time at home. Uh, well, hopefully we all do spend more time at home during the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so uh, you are a theatre professional that, have been, that has been in the business for, for, for some time now. So why don't you tell us what kind of an experience is it for you personally to watch a play online? Because the point uh, for theatre is actually, you know, that it happens uh, right there. Uh, why don't you tell us what it means for you? Um, you know, the, during March and uh, April, so so many companies, you know, uh, like Shabin, Berner, and so, so many companies that we know very well, they open their archives by online uh, streaming, and we had uh, very few live streaming program also. And we also, as a professionals, we discuss uh, discuss too much uh, about the digital theater. What is the digital theater? The future okay. future is the digital theater, and so on. But um, my opinion, op opinion with my of course my colleagues, so digital theater must be only uh, created for the di digital pl platform, registered performance, uh, and show them on the on online is not a real uh, digital uh, theater. So uh, we were uh, we looked for some different projects uh, only uh, created for digital pl platform, and now we have this uh, this program, and we are very happy. Okay, so you'd recommend everyone uh, to see the highlights this year. I understand. Thank you, Leman Yilmaz. It was lovely having you on Showcase today. <laughs>
into the personal diaries of the women. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Everyone put down your brushes. Radium is poison. Bessie, you're trespassing. And everyone seems to agree that the film is a timely statement on corporate deception, saying it couldn't have come out at a better time. When, quote, corporations today put profits over people. For what they've done. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram, and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilfere Ketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Bye.